Well, let's get started. Welcome to the regular meeting of the Board of Library Trustees of April 12, 2022. The time is 6.02 p.m. And Ginger, if you want to call the roll. Trustee Cortez. Here. Trustee Hahn. Here. Trustee Lentini. Here. Trustee Vidot. Chair Ducuse. Here. Thanks, Ginger. And can you explain how the public can participate in this evening's agenda? Good evening, everyone. Viewers are welcome to provide public comment online through Zoom or by telephone at 346-248-7799. And the meeting ID is 849-7621-0268 pound. If you're watching the meeting on Zoom and wish to provide public comment, please select the raise hand feature either on the bottom of your screen or through the participants icon. If you're participating by telephone and wish to provide public comment, please press star nine when the chair opens the public comment period. When it is your turn to speak, you will be notified that the host is inviting you to participate. You will need to press star six to unmute yourself. Once you are unmuted, you will need, you will have three minutes to provide your comments. Thank you, Jinder. Are there any amendments to this evening's agenda? If no, then we can go ahead and approve regular meeting minutes of March 8th, 2022. Uh, are there any questions from trustees to staff or any public comments? Uh, no Alex. public comments. I'll All right. to approve the minutes. I'll second it. Thank you. Uh, Ginger, if you want to roll call vote, please. Trustee Cortez. Aye. Trustee Hahn. Aye. Trustee Lentini. Um, do I abstain since I wasn't there? Okay, then aye. Okay. <laughs> Trustee Vadat. Aye. Chair Duke Hughes. Aye. Thank you, Jinder. Well, um, let's go to item number two, introductions, awards, recognitions, presentations, park pass program update by supervising librarian Katie Port. All yours. Hey, great. Good evening, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. New headset. Great, so I'm here to talk to you tonight about park passes. Let me just share my screen. Great. All good? Okay, good. So I'm here to talk about library park passes. Um, first to let you know what we offer now and also to let you know about an exciting new park pass we're adding to our collection from the California State Park System. So here's the background. A library park pass is just what it sounds like. It's a pass for entry to a local uh, park that you can check out from the library, just like a book or another library item. Um, our first foray into this was about four years ago in 2018. We added these adventure kits that you see here to our collections. Um, and what those contained were two park passes, one to Marin County Parks, one to the Marin Municipal Water District, so that's Lake Bon Tempe and the Sky Oaks Parkway. And then we also included some local hiking guides, some wildlife info, um, and some fun stuff like a compass and a flashlight. And these were marketed to children and teens. They're part of our children and teen collections. Um, and what we noticed after we'd had them in the collection for a while was they were definitely being checked out, but some people just checked them out for the passes. That was what they wanted rather than the rest of the stuff. Um, so the next year we added uh, standalone park passes to the collection. These are county parks passes. Um, again, you check them out just like a book and they allow day use and parking at the parks you see listed there. We found anecdotally that McNears Beach Park and Paradise Beach Park are a couple of the most popular locations people like to go to. Um, and these are very popular, especially in the summer. 
uh, and those have been in our collection about three years now. So in the three or four years that we've had these items, um, they've circulated 739 times, which is great. That means that there's interest in them. Um, and we are really happy with those numbers. Just want to clarify, we don't have 739 kits. They've gone out 739 times. OK, so um, this April, the California State Park System got in touch to let us know they are issuing a new type of pass. Um, this is what they look like. And they allow uh, one vehicle entry and parking to over 200 participating state parks. And this is part of a larger campaign of the state park program. Um, they have sent us three of these passes so far. We will be getting more later, but they've sent them to every public library in the state of California for distribution. Um, here in San Rafael, we're circulating ours the same way we do our other park passes. So you can request them or place them on hold in the catalog. Um, and when it's your turn, you check them out for one week and they don't renew. And they are valid for one car or one motorcycle. Um, and the state has been working on getting a list of exactly which parks are it is valid at, but I did verify that it's valid at the state parks um, here in Marin County, like Samuel P. Taylor, um, Tamales, oh, I'm blanking, Tamales, um, you know, where Hearts Desire Beach is out at Point Reyes. Um, and the other popular Marin parks. Um, so we're gonna be doing a bit of promo. Um, we're not gonna go nuts because right now we just have the three, um, but we are gonna put it in the email newsletter. Uh, we're doing a social media campaign. We were, we got the passes out for circulation yesterday. Um, and we're pleased that we're the very first library in Marin that actually got these out and they immediately went out on holds. So there was already um, a little request queue that had built, so they are out and with the people now. Um, and as you know, uh, spending time in the outdoors is associated with better health outcomes, not just for physical health, but for mental health. And during the pandemic, visiting our local parks um, has been one of our most beloved and safest pandemic activities. And um, I know that visiting our our local parks is such an important part of Marin culture. And so we're happy to support it in this way. Um, the California State Parks stated mission for the project is to reduce barriers to park access because um, although most Californians live very near a state park, the access to them is very unequal in different populations. And so the goal here is to reduce, um, reduce barriers to accessing our state parks. Um, so we're very pleased to be adding this extra type of park pass to our collection. Um, we're excited that people have found out about it even before we started promoting it. Um, and we hope that you will join the holds queue for it as well. Um, if you have any comments or questions, I'd be happy to take them now. I love this photo. Um, Mount, Mount Tamalpais State Park is also um, one that you can enter with, with this new type of park pass. Questions, comments, or thoughts? Happy to hear them. Any questions? I don't have a question. I just think that is so awesome that you're starting this and you're adding to this program and the state park system is jumping on board. I think it's great. Do you think, um, I mean, yeah. it sounds like you've had really good um, demand, but obviously, you know, you don't have like, you know, 300 passes. I mean, how do you imagine, like, do you think there's opportunity for you to have more available if there's if this is really popular? Yeah, great question. And I've been thinking about that too, of course. A um, couple of options. We're waiting. Um, you sort of get the feeling there's a lot of excitement in the state park system about it, but um, they're like, more info is coming. We're going to send you a few and then we'll send you some more. So I thought I would wait and see how many more showed up, but there is potentially a possibility maybe to purchase some more. I'd have to look at the budget. In the past, this type of um, state parks pass has been maybe $100 or $150 each, the annual pass. So that might be a way. Um, I forgot to mention, we're also planning some programming around it um, that's sort of access focused. We, in the past, have done kind of an outdoor theme for um, summer reading. Um, last year we did that Tales to Trails kind of program and we're going to be picking up that theme this year and we just scheduled a bunch of story times with rangers for this uh, summer with park rangers, so that might be a good way to feed into it. 
Um, I think we'll look at the demand and, and try to meet it. That's always, that's always our goal. Um, I shouldn't overstate when, when, the, when the park passes went out yesterday, the hold list was 10 people, not 10,000. So. <laughs> but still, that's pretty great that, you know, before you've even promoted it, that's great. And I think maybe you can, I, I've seen, there's been a lot of promo, like my mom sent me an article from the LA Times. So I guess there's been like word out in the community. Um, let me know if any of you have heard about this. So state parks kind of got out in front promoting it. So I think people are excited. Mm, great. Thanks. Any other comments or questions from trustee? I just want to ditto what Cheryl said. Oh, Great. Sorry. I love it. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. This is just um, kind of a brief informational item, but we're we're just really excited about it. And I think it fits really well with our mission of you know equal access to public resources. That's that's what we're all about at the library. This is great. Thank you so much. Uh, very exciting things happening. Um, thanks, Katie. Any questions from the public? Um, and, and thanks, Katie. But I uh, just wanted to check, Ginger, is there anyone who might have questions? Uh, no attendees. Great. Well, thanks so much, Katie. Sure. On my way out, I should have said if you want to see all the park passes we offer, search the catalog for library park pass, and that you can see all the different types we have and placeholds. Okay. Good to see you all. Very cool. Bye. Great. Um, so let's move on to item three. Public comment from the audience regarding items not listed on the agenda. But there's no, no attendees from the public, right? Thank you, Jenner. So then uh, item number four, Marine Night Radio Frequency Identification RFID update. And uh, Henry, over to you. Catherine. Thank you, Chair Duke Hughes. I have this presentation. I will be sharing my screen. Uh, just a sec. Can everyone see that? Yes. Awesome. Wait, I'm at the wrong slide. Just a sec. All right. So uh, this presentation is an update on our radio frequency identification um, project. A um, couple of um, summary items. Um, we're in that as a whole in San Rafael Library has been a, somewhat of a late adopter of this technology. I think it was first implemented in the Bay Area around 2003. Um, we started discussing it as a Marin Net board, you know, three or four years ago. And, um, you know, we've recently been able to um, start tagging almost the entire collection, which is great. Um, RFID stands for Radio Frequency Identification. It's a uh, pretty um, pervasive technology. For example, um, your baggage tags um, are often RFID enabled. Um, it For the library, it translates that barcode that you see on the book, the unique identifier into a radio frequency that can be identified by, um, by a special pad and takes the place of the barcode scanner, the optical barcode scanner. Um, it, it does create more efficient processing of books when paired with automated materials handling, which is a machine that, you know, with a conveyor belt, usually, where when you put your book in the book drop, it automatically checks it in and sorts it for further processing or for shel direct shelving. But the system also has advantages standalone without automated materials handling. And, and those that that um, that kind of um, improvement does radically reduce the repetitive stress and the kind of um, laborious labor in 
sort of that has been part of circulating material items within the library and allows us to kind of you know repurpose staff to more customer facing uh, tasks um, we made this decision in 2020 the marin that is 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 a consortium of seven public libraries and two academic libraries uh, Dominican and College of Marin. I believe D Dominican is not RFID tagging. Most of their collection is sort of, um, you know, they hang on to everything and, and they don't have the same use of the collection as the public libraries in the system. Um, you know, we decided to do this in 2020, uh, the, right as the pandemic hit. We, we had hoped to get it all done when we were all closed and doing curbside, but we weren't able to kind of make that happen. And just recently at the beginning of this year in January, tagging started at many of the Marin that libraries. And it's been completed at San Rafael and most of the other libraries except for Marin County Free Library, which uh, they're currently looking for local talent to work on the project, more on that later. Um, as with regards to privacy, um, many of you might have heard of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. When this technology first came out, it was seen to be um, possibly problematic in terms of patron privacy, in that there was a thought that that you know bad actors could could set up their own RFID device and scan the book that you have and identify you know what book you have and get your personal information and that's generally been deprecated as kind of somewhat of misinformation as the tag only contains basically the unique identifier for the book and some format information additional metadata sort of like is this a book is it a dvd is it um you know an audio book and what library it belongs to so it, it has become somewhat of a non-issue within the field, though it, it was one of the reasons for, I think, the delay in our adopting this technology. And if you look back through the annals of library kind of discussion in Marin County, that would come up. Um, and then generally the, 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 the practice has been, and I haven't heard of anything different, is that your library card that connects to your specific personal information is not RFID enabled and and you will always scan or enter that you know physically so you're you're additionally protected by by that so um privacy though a concern when this first came out has been you know the questions have been answered and it it, it really isn't a concern overall i did have the 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 experience of if taking an RFID enabled book into a retail store and it did set off the scanner, but but you know you just show them you, you have a library book so so it, there could be other contingent you know challenges you can't microwave an R, RFID enabled book so some people do microwave their library books in order to kill germs I think can't do that um, so so the implementation process is somewhat laborious. Um, the method is to go through the stacks with a cart that has a scanner affixed to it. You scan the barcode on the book. You program the tag, which is about two inches by two inches, and then affix it to the one of the back pages of the book or in, in a variety of locations. They stagger them, you know, top, middle, bottom. It's You can't really see the tag from outside the book. Um, and then, you know, put the book back on the shelf. So, so it's, it's kind of time intensive. Thus, um, we hired an outside contractor to do this. Initially, I had been convinced that our own staff could do this, but it, it became clear that we had a ton of other priorities and we were not fully staffed and it was really efficient to hire an outside contractor. And they, they came to town, I think they're based in Provo, Utah, and then hired some of lo local talent, some people that have worked for us as temporary staff, and which had a, a, a additional effects that then, you know, some of those people we have hired, you know, so it worked out very well. And it took them not 
very long, like about a month and slightly more, which, you know, now all of our books are tagged and we have started using RFID pads in the circulation room to check in materials. Uh, once all of our items are tagged and Marin County Free Library is tagged, we were hoping to work together with them on, you know, an AMH, which is Automated Materials Handling Project, which would be that system where you, when you return the book, it's checked in and routed to a bin and it makes easier sorting and return of materials. On top of that, the customer experience is much improved because there's no longer a the question, did my book get re checked in? It's immediately checked in and the customer can see that in their account and there isn't that delay and the potential for the book not getting checked in is much reduced. The timing of our own project would be contingent upon our, a new library facility, possibly avoiding the need to move a system or install it and move it. Um, and, and uh, you know, the benefits, um, you know, is increasing that accuracy and speed, as I mentioned, you know, we have a ton of people that contact us about, you know, items that they returned, but they haven't showed up on the account. So that should be, that should reduce that. Also, the checkout experience is much improved in that, and, and this is the total truth, you can put a stack of like 10 books on the pad, and they'll all check out at one time and it's less sort of repetitive stress for the patron and it and it's just a, a little you know when you have a bunch of picture books it's going to sort of reduce your um you know your, your kind of repeated motion um and and then just the the potential to make a mistake is still there things will get missed but but it's greatly reduced and then you know it this the 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 thing that benefits us is then people that we employ will do less labor intensive repetitive work and we're able to, to sort of re reassign them to things that are more customer focused when you're interacting with customers or doing higher level work in terms of the collection programming and all the things that we do outreach included. So um, the fiscal impacts for this project that, that we're talking about, just the tagging, um, the Marin County Free Library did kick in half a million dollars to fund the entire consortium. So we were able to draw on that money and not have to pay out of pocket. We had thought we might have to, but the numbers worked out that, that we, we weren't um, called upon to kick in additional funds and that shared money thank you, Marin County Free Library, was able to fund everyone's tagging and that there's some left over for, for the uh, automated materials handling. Um, that will go towards an automated materials handling system at the main county location through which many of our, if not all of our materials are routed. And then the only fiscal impact would be the future additional cost of our system, a system for San Rafael, Roughly thought to be around a hundred thousand dollars, which you know we can afford given the memorial donations that we have, even despite the building of the new library. So, so this this is something that has been brought to the board in the past, and this update, um, you know, shows our progress in our goal of implementing. RFID radio frequency identification technology at the Center for Library as as part of MarinNet as a whole. This concludes my presentation, and I will stop sharing my screen. So, where are you in timing on all this? You know, like what stage are you at, and like when when will it be visible to the library user, and how will it be rolled out to the public? Yes, great question. So it is not visible to the public right now. And because we haven't gotten the correct pads to attach to the self check. So the first way the public would see it was when checking out books. Um, you know, they, they would go up to the self check and be able to check them out with 
a pad where they stack the books up. The supply chain problems have have d delayed our um, special. There's these special pads that won't allow you to reprogram the tag. They're called. Oh, I forgot the word, but we haven't gotten the special pad, so that'll be the first thing. We have the technology in the back room, and we're actively using it as we speak. Um, the other the other um, slowdown is that you know, a huge percentage of what we circulate comes from other libraries, mostly, you know, statistically, because the county library is such a huge part of our consortium, a huge amount comes from them, and all their stuff isn't tagged yet. Thus, the, the, they're, they're actively seeking taggers, they've actually in, increased the, I think, the re, remuneration from 25 to $30 an hour, something like that, or 20 to 25. So, so until that happens, we can't really, and the fact that we haven't gotten the correct scanners, it won't go out to the public until, until those two things happen. And, and we'll be relying on the barcode scanner as, you know, until further notice, I don't have a date. And this is sort of one of the side effects of being part of a consortium that's sharing the, the sort of, main tool the online catalog and physical circulation so it'll be a little while not a huge amount probably in the next few months okay thanks thanks henry and uh yeah really exciting but uh and sorry my video is um, on and off my internet connection uh not the best today but um just curious about what the overlap will be between the two systems and um you mean the two systems like the county sorter and ours yeah because uh, uh, as you mentioned you know we have a lot of items from other libraries and then or is it going to be a cut of paid at least for our library to say the old equipment goes out and the new system comes in uh is it going to be gradual how do you envision that yeah, I, I'm thinking until we have more clarity on the library building projects, there's no false sense of urgency to install an AMH because really, um, you know, the, the efficiencies gained through a centralized sorter, like our system's kind of like a hub. Most things go back to the county and then go out to other places. So that's going to help hugely efficiency wise. And that's a huge project. And there, a little bit more eager to get it done they think in the next fiscal year i i would be slightly curious as to whether that's realistic but but ideally you know depending upon a, several factors and they're beyond our control you know to to go out for an rfq rfp for both systems at the same time would would you know theoretically create an economy of a scale marinnet as a fiscal agency has much like looser sort of rules around like spending money and they're not restricted by the the, the typical um you know open bidding process that we would engage in so we would probably use the same vendor maybe but that's we don't have to and you know it, it, it's it, it all is a matter of timing and then it would be weird if we're doing a public bid and they've already decided the vendor, that would be weird. So so it there's a little bit of additional work that needs to be done on sort of realistically looking at a timeline. The consultant that we hired says moving from one place to another isn't a big deal, but I, I, I moving is always a big deal. And, you know, putting a hole in the side of this building right now and then, you know, you know like like the that that i think we're gonna we're gonna know more about in in the in this year so it's not like gonna be a huge delay before we have clarity but the likelihood is that both systems will work together in, you know one of the cool features is when we get a bin of books from from the central location right now we have to scan each one individually this system will allow a one barcode to know all the items in that bin so we can check them all in at once so so it there's some like really cool features 
But as far as um, the, the two systems working together, you know, the best way to look at it is, you know, the online catalog is kind of one system. So ideally, it'll be more like one system, but funded by by different agencies. Other libraries in the consortium, similar to our size and circulation, I'm not naming names, have been reticent to implement the system just because they didn't want to put the hole in the wall to create you know the pathway because it would mar the facade but in a in a in a sort of modern library project or remodel you you know the architects you know build this in it's baked in so um yeah we'll know more probably in the next three months ish great thanks nice to see all the progress henry i know we've been talking about it forever i know <laughs> I was crazy to think that our own staff would would do the tagging. I was doggedly determined that we were going to do it ourselves. But then I saw the writing on the wall. It's like, oh my God, like have someone else do this? One less thing. And we've been crazy busy even so. So any other comments or questions? Right. Awesome. Okay, well, thank you, Henry. You're welcome. Happy to move us to, uh, unless there's any other comments or questions, to item five. Other brief no reports of any meetings, conferences, or seminars attended by board members. Um, first item Parks and Recreation Master Plan Steering Committee. Um, um, any I'm, comments from Christy? I mean, I was going to say I'm part of that, and we had an initial kickoff meeting um, where the consultant kind of explained how the process was going to go and, you know, kind of introductions. And then uh, we did a little survey that they are also going to be releasing in the community. Um, just questions about, you know, what you know about the parks, you know, what, what do you care about with the parks in San Rafael? Um, so it was, you know, it was, kind of, it was fun start. It was great to see who's um, participating from all the different groups and I don't have them all memorized. So Susan might be able to say more, but it's nice to be part of that. And I'm, you know, glad to be on the, on the committee that's going to see how that process goes. Great. All right, any other comments from board members? Happy to go to uh, staff reports and comments, item six. Other brief program updates or reports on any meeting conferences and or seminars attended by staff. And we have a key problem. <laughs> so traditionally, I, I, uh, I have a lot to say on this item. And then um, I was thinking maybe Susan or Catherine would talk about the Parks and Rec Master Plan some more, but I could be wrong. So um, Marinette board met last week and um, we there was much discussion about the Park Pass program. The State Library really made that happen. The State Library has money this year and they're, they're giving it out for a lot of things, zip books, the park pass, um, a sort of library building program, which we've applied for. Um, and so, you know, it's it's pretty exciting. There was um, the, also a discussion about um, the cost, the costing formula for our consortium is created out of circulation, population, and, um, the, the size of the collection and and I've been one of the the sort of main forces behind reanalyzing this because I don't think those those um, factors really are re meaningful with regards to what we get from the consortium in terms of their support and how much it costs and how to divide it equally among our libraries. For example, you know, libraries that that get as much support from the consortium. Bell Tib, Mill Valley, 
you know, others that that have collections rivaling our size pay half what we're paying. And and it's sort of like very good progress because this is always one of those budget lines of Marin that costs, which we're always kind of overspent on and is rising rapidly and we pay a huge amount, like over 250,000. So it's kind of really get to down to like essentials, the root, the root issues and have a working group that that will actually look at different ways to kind of divide out the costs that that will maybe reflect a change the changes that have happened in the more than 20 years since the costing formula was created very excited about that the other thing we discussed is actually the possibility of not being part of the north net library consortium every library in california is required ish to be part of an official state library consortium to receive imls grant funding things like the park passes and other state funding and we're part of one that goes from here to the oregon border and over to nevada and and whether we might benefit better from being part of the one that circles the Bay Area, it circles the, the Bay with, with everyone circling the Bay except for Marin. And it's called the Pacific Library uh, Partnership. And it's a, a, a set of, of, it's a mega consortium of other consortia, which if we were part of it, we'd be just like everyone else of another consortium within the mega consortium. And they have, um, you know, dues and they, they funnel state money and they have a, an uh, interesting innovation conference in San Francisco every year. So, so I think you know there's there's potential for that. Uh, also, discussion about having MarinNet be its own official consortium. I don't think the state wants a more library consortia because they've been actively been consolidating them. Um, we had a very good equity discussion this time, um, centered around the forward to 1619, shared by the College of Marin person and it was really good and the, and it was focused around you know how does how do we feel about book banning and 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 the the sort of spate of book bannings that have been going on and the effort to kind of restrict information of this type and to brand things like critical race theory as propaganda versus looking at history as you know problematic in the way that it's been taught so this is part of a series where we do an equity conversation every time and it's been going very well. Um, North Net Board has not met since since we last talked. Uh, the Friends of the Library met last Larry, month. Can I, sorry, yes. can I pause and ask a question going back to yes. that series? Who's sure. leading, who's, uh, leading that series? Um, well, each library brings, brings materials. Um, Chantel Walker, initially uh, spawned the project based on what the county had been doing. And she re leads um, a library focused um, program called Creating Equity and in Racial Equity and Inclusion, which, you know, hopefully the county will do again this year. It's, it's like her and Patty Wong from now Santa Clara City Library um, usually have a cohort, but, but it's more like kind of each, each um, library has to, gives readings out and then we discuss okay yeah it's not like organized in, in a in a greater fashion than that but yes um the friends of the library uh i i don't know if i attended the meeting last time susan can you help me the last friends meeting um it was in march so um yeah, Jill presented. Yeah, Mark. about uh, manga. Yeah, right. yeah. We're very excited that the friends have have been more flexible at, about funding the library in in telling us just how much they have available, and then we can apportion what we need. And we have sort of a new collaborative relationship with the friends. Uh, they're I think continue to be extremely excited about using the community center for their book sales, which means a lot less set up tables and put away and, and, and the ability to kind of, you, you know, have it under a roof. It's been going very well. <laughs> um, and then I went to the PLA conference in Portland, Oregon. Um, and many, uh, a huge focus on equity and inclusion, normalizing the conversation. Um, 
many East Coast larger urban libraries have been doing a ton of work in this area, which we can benefit from. And then I attended a, a, a conference by Marin County, uh, someone from Colorado and someone from Redwood City about allyship in the workplace. I think one of the themes I saw was that often BIPOC staff members are or unduly sort of drawn into a celebration for that month, Black History Month, and then the rest of the year, like maybe ignored or, or less focused. And, and there was a theme of making Black History Month back the whole year. And, you know, Asian American AIAP hate, anti-hate part of, part of the entire year and kind of being more sensitive about how we discuss race in the workplace. So, you know, lots of good material. I was off last week, so I haven't completely digested. Public Library Association happens every two years and moves around the country. It was in Indianapolis, Indianapolis Denver, uh, Chicago, I think. And um, it's basically one of the subgroups of ALA, the American Library Association is the Public Library Association. Um, lots of headline speakers, fewer vendors this year. Um, I guess they, people think that librarians are into Jeopardy because Amy, one of the winners of Jeopardy was, that was the first trans person to win Jeopardy was at the conference to great, great, um, like everyone was very excited. I'm not a particularly a, a Jeopardy fan, but it, but it was a great presentation. Um, so I think Henry, that's you, all the meetings, yeah. Henry, do you just attend those or do all the supervising librarians attend? Um, that's kind of a pricey one. And, and I've been on ALA committees and been on the, I was the chair of the PLA um, technology committee. So I've attended this for the past 10 or 15 years. So we can only afford for me to go, it's sad. But Ca California Library Association is local this year and we're, we're planning to send a large number of staff members-ish, like possibly 10 people. And I'm involved in three presentations. The library as a whole, our library is, has gotten two accepted. So we plan to like make a push there. But yes, in the future, I, I need to sort of step back and have the supervisors attend these and, and I can sort of tend to my garden. <laughs> well, it just seems like some of the topics you were talking about. Would yes, be really good. yes, I've been sharing and bringing back the info. But, you know, out of state conferences, we tend not to to want to send, you know, many people to that. Yes. Got it. It's also um, we do a lot of vendor stuff there, like talking to vendors and, and uh, consultants and um, other library consultants. So so I have a like ton of connections. So I am kind of well placed to, to represent the library, but I would love to be able to 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 bring along, you know, the entire leadership team. It's just kind of a funding thing. We we kind of like slashed our travel and training budget in a huge way. Uh, I think that's all the the, um, the the meetings, conferences, and seminars. And did you want to talk about uh, the Parks and Rec Master Plan, Susan or Catherine? I'm going to let Catherine talk about okay. it. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, as a commission or trustee, I'm so used to the Park and Rec Commission. Trustee uh, Lentini mentioned we had our first steering committee meeting in. March, um, and that was followed by our first community outreach meeting, which was held on March 30th at the Santa Fe Community Center. That's kind of the first in a, a series. We cut, we held that one in late March and then kind of um, solidified the other meetings just based on how that went. Um, what we saw was because it was held at the Santa Fe Community Center, we had a lot of folks from like Gerstle Park and Peacock Gap and Sun Valley um, so what we've decided to do is hold that same meeting um, in different locations around the city. So we will be holding one on April 28th at, in, at the Terra Linda Community Center. We'll be holding one May 5th virtually, and then we'll be holding one on May 11th at the Boro Community Center, and that one will be in Spanish. Um, so that's really exciting. We also launched a, the questionnaire 
um, that Trustee Lentini mentioned. Uh, that was launched on the 30th. It's open through May 20th. So we haven't, we're just gearing up to do kind of a big push right now um, since it's it's open for a while. Um, that's online, um, but it also, we have uh, paper copies at all the community centers, libraries, and city hall if, if folks prefer to go in and, and grab a paper copy. Um, so that's really exciting to be kind of in the thick of that community engagement piece. Um, we've also been meeting with the, the consultants did a tour of all of our parks and all of our community centers. That was three and a half full days of traveling around to each site. So it was, we've got a lot, we have a lot of parks. Um, our facilities take a lot of time to assess as similar to the Carnegie, they're quite, um, well loved <laughs> and well used. Um, so there's kind of a lot to look at. Uh, so we're we're really excited. It's moving forward. We're getting some great participation. The steering committee is a really great um, representative group from from all over the city, all different um, kind of representing a lot of different interest groups. Um, so yeah, we're we would love for any of you all to participate in in any of the community meetings that interest you. Um, those are those are open to everyone. The steering committee meetings, I believe, are there. Those are public meetings as well. Should you want to sit in and listen to them? Um, uh, yeah. Anything I'm missing, Susan? Oh, you're muted. Yeah, I don't think you missed a thing. I I would just highly encourage all of you to take a, take the questionnaire and it to people that you know that are interested. Um, it's really important because obviously the statistically valid survey went to a number of homes, right? That's the whole point of it. But the questionnaire is an open up to everybody. So, you know, family, children can take it. So it's not like you have to be over 18. So any of the residents would be highly encouraged to fill out and it's really important. Um, so please, you know, go to our website, download the questionnaire. Um, I think Catherine mentioned it is available in Spanish and Vietnamese. So hard copy, you know, um, online copy, you know, we will take it any old way. So please encourage people that you know to take it. So we get really good information from a broad spectrum of individuals, not just the people who show up to meetings. Yeah, and we'll, we'll be putting out a e-blast this week. Um, as well as some as flyers that address both the questionnaire and the upcoming meetings. So I can make sure um, Henry gets that and, and it's for or gender and, and it's forwarded to you all. How many people attended that the first meeting? About 30. Um, I just had a question because uh, I'm the alternate on the um, master or the steering committee. And I got an email from the consultant saying that uh, for folks who want to attend the community meetings, they just need to get a head count before because I guess there could be some Brown Act issues if too many folks come. So is that something that we should just check in first if we want? Because that's why, you know, I've been hesitant to go to the meetings. I don't know if that's something we need to check in with you all first if a board member wants to go. Susan, would that be a, would that apply to the library board since it's not? No, Alex, I think is referring to that he's the alternate to right. trustee Lentini. So um, all you would do is RSVP to Lauren, who is the consultant. She's kind of the project manager for RHAA and let them know that you're interested. We will, we will take a look at the count and make sure that we're not, we don't have a violation. Quite honestly, the steering committee is so large that I'm a better knock on wood here. It is <laughs> highly unlikely that we're going to hit quorum, but we're just doing that to make sure because we're kind of caught between a rock and a hard place. If we notice it as a meeting and we don't have quorum, then we have to cancel it. So you can imagine with a community meeting, you don't want to do that. So it's actually better to say just RSVP, we'll take a look at the count and make sure that we're within that, that framework and then we can move ahead. Um, but we do highly encourage you guys to come and let us know if you're interested in any of the meetings. We do have a virtual meeting that's coming up that makes it really easy to participate. It's pretty much a mirror image of each other um, until I think the September meeting. September meeting is a culmination where they really take all the information that's been gathered through the process 
and they push it back out. But all the meetings prior to that is very similar. It's very similar um, for those of you who are involved in the library planning process three years ago, where we had a similar meeting at the San Rafael Community Center and then we held it at the Terra Linda Community Center and we held it at City Hall. It was really to make sure we went to all areas of town to gather the same type of information. So it's really great. And the last time at the steering, uh, excuse me, at the community meeting, I think we had two steering committee members. That's it. And I think the steering committee, if you add in all the alternates, you're in double digits. So I think we're good. I appreciate the clarification. Absolutely, absolutely. Any other questions about that? Okay. All right, Henry, do you want to share where we are in the process of the library planning process? Yes, I'd love to share that. Um, let's see now. We, we uh, did an initially, um, earlier in the year, we did a community, a, 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 a scientifically relevant survey and we're we're doing another survey and we're also um, um, enlisting some additional consultants with regards to the feasibility of a tax measure in the fall at the next election um, that's pretty exciting um, we I, I feel like we we have 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 we decided on on this that that what's likely to what we understood from the previous survey was people seemed less likely to support something new and more likely to support fixing things so that's informing the process um we are we are had been um awarded a million dollars for our building project so we're we're working uh rapidly to make sure we get that encumbered in the state budget um, and and that's pretty exciting in and of itself. Our local assembly member, Mark Levine, spearheaded that effort and both us and Larksburg got a million dollars. So we're, we're hoping to devote that towards uh, a design process for a new library building. Um, I also applied for competitive state grants for our three locations. Um, they, the state library has communicated that the the um, relative poverty index of the library uh, library's jurisdiction, um, where the physical library is located, will be one of the determining factors. So we're likely to, if we get any any funding, to get something for pickleweed, but we won't know for a long time. Um, there's a maximum of ten million for each of these grants. I also applied for the downtown and for the mall just. You know, because you know we we could possibly get money for all three, but we won't know for a little while. And this is part of the state's uh, building forward infrastructure library funding uh, initiative. And there could be second or third rounds. I think there's four hundred and seventy something million in total that they're giving out. So if we got one of those things for for the for our library project, that that would also increase increase our, the feasibility in some way shape or form but we haven't really gotten the funding for the whole 50 million plus ish yet so we're still working on that but progress is being made did i leave anything out <laughs> no just to clarify because it, it you know we know what we're trying to say but there's so much information there's really three avenues of funding that we're pursuing right now. One is a tax measure, which references the survey that was done in January, which is, you know, our citizens supporting a tax measure. That's one. And then Henry was referring to two different grants that he's applying for. One is a million dollars specifically for the Carnegie and then another state grant that would be supportive and provide funding to all three locations. So we're really trying to go after everything that we can. And Henry's done a lot of work on that. So um, very appreciative. But the next step as far as the tax measure is we're currently routing two contracts. One is with Brian Godby again, and one is with a political, I don't know if the 
proper term is political consultant, but it is who you bring in when a city is considering a tax measure to strategize the best um, public messaging to make sure and education to make sure that the public understands what the city is trying to achieve and to raise awareness and support. So once that goes out, then there will be a midpoint survey done again to see if we've moved the support sufficiently to put the ballot measure on the ballot in November. If that survey looks like, okay, we're going in the right direction, but we're really not where we need to be, the council might decide continue the education and awareness and put it on the ballot at a later date to make sure that we have enough public support that it will pass. It only requires 50%, but the first survey that we did on this general tax measure was hovering below 50%. And so you really need it to come in over 50%. Actually, our consultant said about 55 plus would be really a sweet spot. But when it doesn't come in at 50, you're really um, you're kind of gambling. So the whole idea is, OK, we need to go back out there and really educate the public and then take um, you know, an assessment of where that public is, where the interest is. And if it's really positive, then the council most likely would put it on the ballot in November. If it's still not high enough, we would continue the education and awareness and public campaign um, and then decide to put it on a later ballot when we're sure it's going to pass. The council's pretty committed on this. So they just want to make sure that when they go to the ballot, um, they have, I guess the best way to put it is they believe it will pass. We don't want to put it on the ballot because we believe it will fail. So um, that's kind of where we're at. That's why those two consultants are being brought back in um, to put extra effort into this. So that's one effort. And then the two grants that uh, Henry spoke about, he's already a, he's in the process of applying for one, finishing that one, and he's already applied for the other one. So we're going after every source we can. Susan, can you clarify, um, or Henry, um, with these new things that you're going after, is it in putting this other additional survey and all this, are we at a recommendation still level or is it just in general? Where is the recommendation, the B Street, you know, merging? Is it the um, staying and refixing or is it just a general question of what the appetite is? I'm, I'm unclear on where we're standing with that. That's a really good question. I, I can tell you where I think it's leaning, but as soon as we get these two contracts tied up, then we will be going back and meeting with a couple of the council members in city management. The initial information that we got back from the general survey was, as Henry put it, people, our residents were extremely supportive of fixing items that we already have. Storm drains, streets, um, gosh, I'm trying to think of all the other things, infrastructure of buildings, ADA improvements. Um, when we, in the survey, it queued things like new parks, new libraries, they did not test as well. Fixing the library, fixing our existing parks did test better. Um, the thing that tested best was potholes. I'm not really interested in potholes on a personal <laughs> basis, but those are the types of things that were really received well. So just from that initial information back, I think the direction most likely would be towards the Carnegie because the Carnegie is an existing building. It's an older building. And the whole point of addressing that site would be to renovate and expand. I think it's a farther reach saying it's renovating and expanding the Albert Park location because we all know that what we were actually doing was we were leveling the existing building and building a brand new one. So most likely people higher up than me will probably lean towards the Carnegie based on what they're hearing the public wants, which is kind of what we, we thought all along. I mean, we got some of that, that information early on that that probably was the fan favorite. So 
most likely that's the direction I'm guessing it's going to go to, but I'm not, it's a little premature, but I'm, I'd put some money on it. I think that's where it's going to go. So back yeah. where we were like two years ago. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it is what it is. You know, I think at the end of the day, what we really want is what the community wants, right? The community is paying for this, hopefully, and they're supporting it. And at the end of the day, we want a great library and we want the great library that the community really wants. And if it's the Carnegie, fantastic. If it's Albert Park, fantastic. So we're not picky at this point. We, we just want the, we want a great library, right? So either location would be just fine. And if the community is going to support one, then, then we're really happy about that. Yes. Any questions about that? So keep your fingers crossed. We're really excited. Um, so it's a lot of it's a lot of process, but hopefully there's light at the end of the tunnel. I just want to say, you know, thank you to you, thank Henry, you. and Catherine for the dedication. I know it can be a very insane process and feel very repetitive and like you're beating your head against the wall. So um, thank you guys for sticking with it local civics and local politics can be pretty, pretty brutal. So thank you. Thank you, Alex. I, I will tell you there's people on this uh, meeting tonight and the foundation and the Friends of the Library have been, have been campaigning for a new library for several decades, probably longer, but we know at least over 20. So um, they're the real heroes here. We're just trying to get it over the finish line. Thank you for the update. Um, and yeah, we'll keep our fingers crossed for sure. Uh, any other questions or comments? And no members of the public right get there? Uh, yes, no attendees. All right, well, I think that brings this meeting to an end and our next meeting is May 10th, 2022. Henry, if you wanna close us off. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. We'll see you Thanks. in May. Bye. Thanks, Thank you. Bye. Bye.